Good afternoon, everyone. The role of the speech-language pathologist in the treatment of pulmonary aspiration in elderly is a part of a multidisciplinary approach uh, that includes um, a number of physicians, the ENT, the pulmonary specialist, the neurologist, the geriatric specialist, the radiologist, the nurses, the nutritionist, the physical therapist, and the occupational therapist. So usually we deal with the dysphagia in uh, post-tracheal intubation, tracheostomy, neurological disorders, face and neck surgeries, oropharyngolaryngeal surgeries, and post-radiation. The role of the speech therapist is targeted in the assessment and in the rehabilitation. In the assessment, uh, we work on uh, several parts as speech therapists. We work on the medical history, and it's very important. Uh, the endoscopic evaluation that is done usually with the ENT, assisted by the speech therapist to be able to, um, to assess the consistency of the bolus given to the patient and the volumes. The modified barium swallow, and we set the protocol with the radiologist, and we assess the consistencies and the postures and the maneuver, uh, maneuvers during the modified barium swallow. Um, we have the functional evaluation of the speech therapist, observing a patient during a meal, and we can work on the swallowing handicap index to see the impacts of the dysphagia on the, um, on the daily life of the patient. So we're gonna describe here the summary of these, uh, these assessments, and we're gonna start with the anatomic and physiologic assessment. Um, we can assess directly the velopharyngeal closure by the endoscope or uh, by putting a mirror under the nose of the patient, and it's done through oral sounds, alternation of oral and nasal sounds, dry swallows and swallowing liquids, and we look for a complete movement or incomplete movement for uh, lateral wall uh, symmetry, the amplitude of, um, of the movement, if it's slowed, and if it's precise, on time, and well coordinated. Then we look to the appearance of the hypopharynx and the larynx at rest. We see if there's any abnormality, any pathology. We look for the symmetry and for involuntary movements at rest. Um, we also um, assess secretions and if there are any reaction to any spontaneous swallowing as a reaction to the secretions. How is the patient handling these secretions? Uh, what's the appearance and the viscosity of the secretions? Uh, the frequency of dry swallows has to be spontaneously one per minute. If there is no um, spontaneous swallowing, we can cue the, swallow the swallows, and we see if there's, a, if, there is a, if there's an efficient clearance for these secretions. Um, if the, um, the secretions are standing in the hypopharynx, uh, we test, uh, we score zero for the normal position, one for the pooling in the valicule on the pyroforms, and two for the pooling in the vestibule if it's transiently, three for the, um, for the pooling in the laryngeal vestibule if it's consistently. Then we assess the base of tongue and the pharyngeal function, so we assess the tongue and the base of tongue tonicity and back movement, and the pharyngeal muscles. Uh, through exercises of tongue pulled back against resistance and tongue pushing against res resistance, and we do strained, loud, high voices and trills, and we assess the symmetry of the movement and the range and the amplitude. Then we go into the larynx and we see the breathing at rest, if it's normal, if the respiratory rate is normal at three to four seconds each, if it's, at, um, if it's abnormal, if there's any exaggerated amplitude, and we test the inhalation if it's deep, and the alterna alternation of light inhalation and voicing. The laryngeal function is also tested on phonation on repeated A, A, A uh, five times in a row and glide up in pitch on voice. Um, the laryngeal function can be normal or abnormal. There can be a glottic gap, there can be a paralysis or a paresis on the vocal cords, an asymmetry or a hyperadduction, slow movement or irregular movement. We test also um, the, compet the competence of the patient for breath holding. We ask the patient to hold the breast lightly to assess the true vocal cords contact, and uh, then we ask him to hold the breath tightly to assess the false vocal cords contact and the arytenoids, and sustain breath holding till 10. We assess the cough, 
the movement, uh, the function of the larynx during the cough and clearing throat. The sensory testing is done through stimulation, so it's ha it has to be tactile in the mouth, thermic, and gustative stimulations. We test the normal reflexes, uh, the gag reflex on the posterior pillars, and the cuff, ref re the cuff reflex by a pressure on the first and the second tracheal ring. And we see if there's a biting reflex that is coming back in the dementia or in the neurological disorder, and that can be a problem to the feeding of the patient. We also can do the sensory testing with the presence of the endoscope, uh, with a light touch of the tongue, with a light touch of the pharyngeal wall of the epiglottis, and we can uh, test the response to direct air pulse in the, um, in the larynx. Then we pass into the direct examination of the swallowing and uh, of the swallowing of food and liquids. And usually when we do it with the endoscope, we dye the food and liquids with green or blue with food coloring. And we start the protocol with ice chips as uh, one third or one half of a teaspoon dyed in green when the patient has uh, been not swallowing for a certain period of time. If we have a doubt about the patient not being able to swallow at all, we start by the ice chips because ice chips is it's iced, it's very cold, so the patient keeps it in mouth and has time to prepare the swallowing phase and the pharyngeal phase. And if there's any aspiration that occurs, usually it's a very thin liquid that is not supposed to be harmful for the, lung, for the lungs if we have only one trial. Usually if the ice chips does not pass and there's an aspiration or the patient cannot swallow them, it means that the prognosis of, uh, of the swallowing is not very good and we have to continue the therapy before uh, giving any food trials. If the ice chips are okay in swallowing, we pass to the thin liquids thick liquids, puree, semi-solids, soft solids, then hard, chewy, crunchy, and at the end, if everything is okay, we can pass into mixed consistencies. And consistency is not, um, is not enough. We have to be able to measure the amount of the bolus size. If the patient has poor pulmonary clearance, we start the assessment with less than five milliliters. If it's okay, we pass to five milliliters, then to 10 to 15 to 20 millimeters. Then we can ask the patient to have single swallow from a cup or a straw. And then, if it's okay, pass to consecutive swallows of food and liquids. And assess the patient during his own normal meal if he can have one. So during the swallowing food and liquids, we assess the oral preparatory stage, the oral transit, the lingual propulsion of the bolus, we have to, to look for unmasticated bolus. For example, in this picture, we can see in, in, in green that there is, we don't have one body of bolus in the mouth, and this can, um, can lead into, um, sorry, and this can lead into leaks during the preparatory stage before swallowing. So with the endoscope, we can see in green there is leak liquids. And in the second picture, it's something that we can see in the, in the modified barium swallow, we can see that the leak is starting before, um, before the, the initiation of the pharyngeal phase and before the back movement of the tongue. Usually, orally preparatory time has to be measured. For liquids, it's 0 0.5 to 2 seconds. And for food, the normal range is from 4 to 14, sec 14 seconds and can go up to 16 seconds depending on the consistency of what the patient is chewing. And, um, and we can also measure the percentage of swallows that goes into the valicule or the pyriform sinus or the laryngeal rim during the, um, the, phase, of, um, during the phase of the preparatory, um, of the oral preparatory stage. We can also draw the point, uh, in the protocols, we can also draw a point reached by the bolus on the picture of the larynx, blue for liquids and red for solids. And note what was the most problematic point and the food consistency where the aspiration occurred before the swallowing. So if it's outside the larynx, if it went on the rim of the larynx, or if it went within the larynx and where it's located. So here in green we can see that um, the food went into the rim of the larynx and this is what we see on the endoscope during the food trials. 
Then, if there's a penetration or aspiration before the swallow, does the material enter the larynx? If it's above the vocal cords, does the patient sense it and expels it or does not sense it? If it goes on the true vocal cords again, if he senses it or not, if it goes below the true vocal cords, does the patient spontaneously expectorate or tries to expel but cannot do it, or he doesn't even attempt to expel it? Then we assess the bolus driving. So we assess the base of tongue movement, the velar elevation, the muscles of the pharynx, the hypolaryngeal elevation, the epiglottis inversion, the laryngeal elevation, the laryngeal valve, the closure of the arytenoids, the true vocal cords and the false vocal cords adduction, and the epiglottal inversion. So we look for asymmetry during the swallowing, reduced range or amplitude, reduced speed of swallowing. During the swallowing, do we have any aspiration or not? Do we have a penetration above or on the true vocal cords? Does the patient sense it, sense it, it? Or, and expels it or not? Does the aspiration go below the true vocal cords? And what is the reaction of the patient? After the swallowing, we look for residues. What are their amounts? Is the patient aware of these residues? Does he do any spontaneous swallows to clear the residues? And if the clearing effective, somewhat effective or not effective, what is the location of these, of these residues and their most problematic side. After the swallows and between the swallows, we can have aspiration. When does it occur? Immediately on inhalation or delayed. Is the penetration again above the true vocal cords, on the true vocal cords or below? And what's the reaction of the patient? We look for uh, reflux in the hypopharynx. And it's very important to try maneuvers and their effects during the swallowing assessment. So to be able to note what's the most safe bolus consistency and volume that the patient can have, what were the best methods of delivery? Was it the spoon, the straw, the cup, the syringe, or others? Do we have to give a small rate of delivery and wait till the patient clears the residues? Is there any problem with the taste that the patient can have? And can we alternate liquids and solid bolus or not? The effective postural changes can be chin tuck, head turned to left or to right, side lying, and maneuvers can be additional dry swallows before going into another food intake, tight breath hold during swallowing, a forceful swallow, Mendelssohn maneuver, three-step swallow or other maneuvers. So, in summary, the, um, the, whole, um, uh, the whole result of uh, the assessment um, is put with all the team, with, um, with the physician in charge, and we decide what are the consistencies, the volume, and the maneuvers, and can we feed orally our patient or not? Do we, do we give him the medication orally? Or uh, do we put them with the mashed food, if the patient is able to have mashed food? Um, can the patient be hydrated or not? And then we pass into the swallowing therapy. And so the swallowing therapy depends on the results of the assessment, and it targets mostly the lower airways protection. So it can be done through functional exercises and maneuvers and postural techniques. It depends on the presence of tracheostomy. It depends on the type of feeding. It depends on the adaptation, adaptation strategies and the taste, because we have to know that the patient has the right to... I have to stop? Okay. okay. Right. So we have to know what the patient likes and we, if we can adapt the taste and the consistencies. And we go into specific rehabilitation functional exercises. The maneuvers are supraglottic swallowing technique, super supraglottic swallowing technique, Mendelssohn technique, repetition of swallows, hat postures, chin tuck, rotation, rotation, and chin tuck. And usually it's, it's very efficient with the vocal cord paralysis and the strokes. We work on the base of tongue, passive and active movements, resistance exercises, empty swallowing with pulled tongue. There's the, the oral 
sensory stimulation that is done bilateral in the mouth, the initiation of the pharyngeal phase and swallowing reflex on the anterior pillars, very fast repetitions with very small iced mirrors, the contraction of the pharyngeal membrane like uh, unvoiced A, voiced he he repeated in fast sequences, pitch glide up, swallowing with pulled tongue, gag reflex stimulation, and finally, and most important, the ascension, anterior movement of the larynx and the vocal cords adduction through hyoid elevation and anterior movement, through jaw exercises with resistance, tongue exercises, glottal exercises, breath holding, empty swallowing with extensions of the head. And most important, the patient, the coordination with the family and the, and the person that feeds, feeds the person the patient, and a repetition of the exercises two to three times per day intensively with um, like 10 repetitions for each exercise. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Leslie. Any questions?